Hello, leader. Welcome back to episode 204 of the Fierce Factor podcast. It's your host, Kaylee here, and very excited for this week's episode. I'll be sharing part two of my recent interview with our Pop Leadership Academy member, nurse practitioner Jenny Guthrie out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Last week, we heard the origin of Jenny's story, and this week, we will continue to peel back the layers to get raw and honest about what's happening in our industry and some of the predictable keys to success for female entrepreneurs in aesthetics. So in this second part of our interview, Jenny and I continue the discussion around team building, talking about how much autonomy and trust one person should have in their role, what happens when it's time for someone to leave and how to make that decision. Jenny talks about the complexities of true thought leadership the skewed optics of social media, and how to differentiate in a world where everyone wants to chase an algorithm. She even uses the analogy of wanting to be the algorithm, which I loved. She shares her proprietary methodology and how that will impact the Glow brand and industry. And she reflects deeply on how her story today, including all of the adversities and challenges she's overcome, will impact her into the future. Overall, you will be so inspired by the wisdom and brilliance she implores through this journey of realizing that there's no such thing as being in control, just having your ability to have the courage to step into the unknown and being willing to accept any outcome. So without further ado, please enjoy this inspiring second part of my conversation with the bold, beautiful, and brilliant Jenny Guthrie. Hi there, welcome to the Fierce Factor Podcast. I'm your host, Kaylee Lindholm. And I think it's time for us women to shift the conversation in business and step into our feminine leadership to do the most iconic work the aesthetic industry has ever seen. Each week, I'll be bringing a powerful dose of strategy, sarcasm, solutions, and sass that will rev up your creativity and ignite your brilliance as you link arms with me along our shared path of personal and professional growth in 20 minutes or less. Let's go. Okay, so we talked about you give trust and then keeping it is earned. Correct. Exactly. And so I don't feel that I give anybody enough trust that they're going to sink my ship. Because we're, I mean, at least where we're at now, the size of the company the role, everything's kind of divided among multiple people. So it's not like before where I had just one person. That's a little bit harder, you know, and that's just a growing pain when you find yourself in that position, but just know you won't stay there forever. You're not just going to have one person necessarily forever. So from that standpoint, you know, we're big enough now with diversified roles that even if one person really messes up, Um, it's not fun. And yes, there is damage and we can suffer from it, but it's not going to sink the ship necessarily. I don't, I don't feel like, um, and just because of the way we have the roles designed and, and, you know, thus far, I could be maybe naive in that regard, but I, that's kind of where we're at, um, you know, with that. And then again, I just keep a watchful eye on, uh, giving them a job description that's in writing. So we have clarity. We do a 90 day review. When we first hire people, we do quarterly meetings. So we're having touch points with them along the way uh, that helps keep communication open. We do monthly staff meetings and we're watching numbers. So there's all these metrics that we're kind of watching. And if we feel like somebody isn't living by our, you know, our values that we have as a company, that's how we judge our, our yes. employees. And so if they're not living up to the values of the company, then we have it, we address that with them, give them an opportunity. And, and you know, and so from that standpoint, and I can't say that, I mean, is somebody going to, you know, that we train going to go off and set up shop across the street from us. I mean, maybe it may happen. Um, but again, I, I have to also just trust that I do my due diligence and ultimately, um, and I have a lot of faith and my, my faith really, it's one of those things where God knows the future and he knows what's going to happen and he knows what people are going to do and not going to do. And I just have to manage my own integrity and manage my own self. And as long as I manage that as best I can and trust him with the rest, um, I believe he makes a way he, he protects and, and those kind of things because I cannot control everything. If anything in my life, I've learned that I can control me 
barely. And that's really about it <laughs> at the end of the day. And um, so from that standpoint, you, you know, and, and that's part of doing business. You just realize that that is part of doing business, that you're going to have people leave unhappy with you. You are going to be the bad guy sometimes. You are going to be misunderstood. If you own a business, people are not going to understand you unless they own a business themselves. And you just have to accept that. I just, you know, I don't like it. It's not my favorite thing. But again, I have to accept that, not spend my emotional energy on that and, you know, spend my emotional energy elsewhere. Yeah. It's interesting because one of the topics that I've sort of been ideating for this live event we have coming up is just this competition conundrum. Um, And I've been thinking a lot about that lately where the industry has grown so much. And so I like my first, you know, job in aesthetics, I was selling lasers and skincare in Beverly Hills. And I remember those days I would camp for the day. I'd have like 30, I mean, literally park my car in one lot and see 30 practices in like one building. That's how competitive and saturated already back, you know, what a decade ago or whatever it was there. But now that's sort of spilling over into the rest of the world and it's becoming a lot more commonplace. So competition is just coming up everywhere. And so, of course, we talk a ton about your brand positioning strategy and we talk about staying ahead of competition. And now you have to think about your own people that you pour into and give all of your proprietary information to and, you know, share everything with and develop and invest in, they could leave and start their own business. And that's a reality. Yep, it is. So it almost to me makes, why are we even talking about the competition down the street when we, this is cultivated in every aspect and every sort of prong that is firing into your business, you know? And so, you know, to that, I feel like, you have to get above it. Like your head has to be somewhere there where you are, which is I will get up every day and operate with integrity and do my best. And what will be, will be. Yes. Yeah, you have to. And because that's the way it just, even a few years ago, um, I just decided that my competition is me. And I have to remind myself of that every day, sometimes more than once a day honestly. And for me, social media is not helpful, to be honest with you. It's just like, I i don't know if it's just the season where I'm at in my life um, or what, but uh, I might have to go see a therapist and talk about that. I have no idea. But <laughs> anyway, I don't think um, you're a lot. That's going to be a big group session. I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I am. Um, and so there's just things. And of course, I in talking with um, one of your other consultants, Krista, we were talking about this the other day and and I used the word trigger. And again, I hate buzzwords. They drive me bananas. Like that's where if you hear me use the word trigger or toxic, I am not on the bandwagon. That I, If I use that word, it is because it's very, like I'm being very purposeful. But some things on social media, just, they just, it triggers me. It's like, why didn't I do that post? Or somebody does a post and I'm like, that's crap. Like I don't, and I'm not going to, I am not going to get into a piss and match with people on social media. It is, that is just no thanks. Yeah. And anyway, so I just have learned, I am not on social media much unless I am doing a post and reviewing it, looking at something for the business and yeah. I'm creating Yes. And I think it's just where I'm at in my life. Maybe I, you know, it's just, you know, last year was a tough year for me. And so I just think maybe my emotional reserves are not where they used to be. And I have to understand that. Like I, okay, this is where I'm at right now. This is what I need to do for myself psychologically to maintain healthy balance. And so if I'm on social media, I'm watching raccoon videos or chihuahua videos or chickens, you know, I'm doing something completely that is unrelated to my business because I need a break and I want social media to be a break for it and not to be this downward spiral into whatever psychological abyss that I'll find myself in. So I just have to say no to it you know, in that regard. Yeah. Only, only a country girl like you would be be watching (laughs) chickens, but um, we're going to have chickens, you know, next year is the game plan that we're jealous of that for sure. 
you know, it goes back to me to like, as you know, just sort of tying a theme to some of the these conversation you know, pieces of this journey we're talking about are these identity shifts that I think you sort of phrased as slower or seasons of growth, right? So we talked about the money problems, then we talk about the people problems, right? And there's always problem. Like that's why we're there's always a problem. Solve problems, right? And so that sort of like brings, I think where, and I know where you have been over the past, you know, couple of years, and I'm jotting this down as I'm writing, because for me, then it's the thought leadership problem. And I think that is where the frustration comes when you're an original creator and thinker, and there's not much originality there in that platform. So like when you turn on and you feel the things you talk about, like, and I think it's a good exercise for everybody. Like what does trigger you when you go, when you look yeah. through your, your social media, everybody does get, get it right. So like, yeah. what is it that bothers you and why? That's a, that's a good suggestion. I'm going to have to do that. And so, because normally I just, I feel it and I'm like, eh, you know, but maybe I need I'll to write it down. Acknowledge, acknowledge the feeling and kind of process it a little bit. And it might yes. be more helpful. So thank you. You just coached sure me. So thank you well, for that. Session here. I think I think what it does is it um, it brings a, a, a level of uh, awareness and and um, just visibility to it. So it doesn't just feel icky. It's like, oh, yeah. that's why. And so you can name it, you know. Yes. And and I and think then it will, it'll shrink. You know exactly. What I'm saying? Because it'll, you it'll diminish it. it. You have more control over it. So I think like from my perspective, knowing what you're you've been working on and I want to talk about this proprietary methodology and why we're talking about it today and not a year ago as well. Um, <laughs> but is, is when you are, um, when you, you transition from this being a curator of info, you're of a, sorry, a collector of experiences and information and lessons. And, you know, you, you see, you start learning things in the world and you're sort of taking collect pieces and turning it into your own thing. And then yeah. you go and you apply it and you do, you become your own creator in the world yeah. It can become very frustrating seeing people talk about themselves as a creator, but they're really a copycat or so. Yeah. You know, it's, it's this. Just, yes. I can't. Oh, I just <laughs> really like, I just, you know, and then of course, I, and I, you know, I do some of the same things. So I'm not being like on my high horse, looking down my nose at everybody. That's not the heart behind it at all. Because I do some of the things like I'm dancing and pointing in the air, like everybody else is. I love doing that stuff. It's fun. And I like the funny, silly side of social media. I don't have my knickers in such a knot that I feel like it's going to disrupt my professionalism or that people are going to think I'm a crappy injector because I dance to a song on social media. Um, I don't think my professionalism is that fragile. But, um, you know, from that standpoint, it's like there is so much. It's just everybody's doing the same thing everybody else is doing. That drove me nuts in high school. It drove me nuts in college. It still drives me nuts to this day. And so it's just something that's, I, you know, I think in everyone's like me too, copycat, um, you know, or you need to post this video. Well, I just saw three people post the same stinking video. I'm not going to do it. Like, that's dumb. Um, you know, unless you're the first person to do it, that's great. Good for you. But then everybody else is just kind of. Oh, that was popular. Let's do that. And that's why algorithms on social media drive me bananas. Because to me, it's just a popularity contest. The algorithm is like, who can, who can beat it and who can get there first? And everybody else is just copying it. It's like, I don't, I want to be the algorithm. Like, I don't want to be following oh, yes. the algorithm. You know, it's like, what, what is it? So, so then right now for me, I literally, even though I'm on social media, I mean, literally my, my personal professional page the last year has been, I've been the least involved with it I've ever been. I'm not saying that's what people should do, but I had to be just because I had other things I had to deal with. I had other fish to fry to get my Missouri rates. You got to say the fish to fry. Uh-huh. I had other things that I had to deal with. So it just wasn't a priority for me. I didn't want to evaporate off of it totally. Um, and so that's where I'm this year. I'm kind of going to have to re- refigure out what we're going to do, but I just, I haven't, it's not been a priority for me yet. And, and when it is, everyone will see that I'm going to do something different. I have no idea what it is. When I figure it out, I'll let y'all know. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, that the challenge is that uh, and we talk social media specifically, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a needed platform. We have to be Absolutely. there to, to yes. show up. Yeah. Um, the challenge is doing it in a way yes. that we, we all feel a bit, a bit sort of restrained to this is, you know, this is the way we have to show up. And that, that how you and I are in a lot in alignment, but you know, women who we work with 
in particular that are alternative thinkers, you know, it can become very frustrating that you, you know, to feel like you're, you're being bound by some like random abstract thing when you know yeah. that the work you do is, is really yeah. special, you know, Who made these rules oh, Who yeah. makes the yeah. algorithm, like what 20 year old yeah. out there is like, and so for me, it's just like, why, yeah. like, I just don't understand all that. Um, yeah. but it is necessary. And it is a very effective marketing tool. And you can do it on the cheap, right? So I'm not down on all social media. It's very, it's important. It's vital. It needs to be done right. You can communicate your brand, your message. People can get to know your personality. So those things are all, all fabulous. And I, I love that we have that as a resource. Yes. So this is in just such a great dovetail. And I appreciate that the conversation sort of went here because we're thinking about this next stage of problems or stage of opportunity. <laughs> the with opportunities. I love that. Being it, of being it um, right? Like, you know, get to know your numbers, learn how to, I mean, essentially this is like our, our pathway in KLC, right? Is like build the business, build the dream team, you know, and then grow yourself as a leader. And so that's sort of where you are, Jenny. So we started talking about, I would, I mean, over at least been a year and a half or so, I think about this whole idea of a proprietary methodology. And you've started, you've, you're, you've written a first draft of a book, like you've got so much in the, yeah, in the works, which, you know, there's stuff behind the scenes that we're not going to share publicly too. But, um, but this idea of differentiating uh, your message and, you know, you're in competition with yourself. It's not so much about like so-and-so down the streets can take my stuff. It's like, no, actually I have something really important to teach, to, to teach this industry, to help the industry grow. And yeah. that's really where your thought leadership stems from. So we set out on this journey together and started kind of just brainstorming and talking through all of this. And then, you know, another trial happens, right? And we mm -hmm. go through this past year. So catch us up kind of there. And then I want to talk about like where we are today and and yep. how we're going to bring this methodology to, to light. Sure. Yeah, I know. I was so excited last year about like, I really, it was one of my number one goals was to really kind of develop this methodology and implement it into my practice and all of that. And I really was excited about it. And it was really fueling my fire. And anyway, but unfortunately, on January the 3rd of last year, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So 2023 took a big nosedive for me because then not only was it unknown, like what's going to happen to my business, like what's going to happen to me, you know, because then now you've got you've all these other demons that you have to kind of battle while you're going through all of that. And, and so thankfully, we caught it very early. And I did not have to do chemo or radiation, which I'm very, very fortunate and blessed that I didn't have to do that. However, it did, came with its own baggage. You know, I just thought we'd be, I'd be done with it by April and we could just move on with life. Um, unfortunately, that's not how it played out. And 2023 was a lot like Groundhog Day for me. It's just this recurrent nightmare happening where I wound up almost every other month I was hospitalized or having surgery. And I had five surgeries last year, six mm -hmm. hospital stays, was septic twice, about died once. You know, it was just really terrible, really awful. You know, your, your health and your body takes a beating, your mind takes a beating. And I'm so thankful that my team was where it was. Number one, I'm grateful that the manager who'd been with me for seven years that went AWOL, I fired her because if she would have been running the show, while I was sick with cancer, my ship would have sunk. I would have been the Titanic. I would have been. So I had to have the spine and the balls to look that situation in the eye, acknowledge it for what it was, get past my heartbreak over it and deal with it, which is what I tell every one of my team members, like, don't back me in the corner in my business because I will never fail the team. I will never fail the business. I don't care what decision I have to make, how hard it is, who it is. I will make the right decision for the business at the end of the day, period, dot. And I, you have to have that clarity in those moments because sometimes it's murky and it's gray and it's painful and it hurts and things are happening that you don't want to have happen. Um, but I'm thankful I did that because if I hadn't done that at that time with that employee, then with the cancer diagnosis, it would have been a poop show. Really? Yeah. And I was thinking too, like we, you know, the difficult decision that it's almost toying with your, it's making you question your, 
motive as like a woman, you know what I mean? And like your the, the empathy and like the care that you have, like as a human, and you start to think of yourself, like, am I such a machine that yeah. like, I'm making this decision in the business, but it's actually making somebody feel like that, or it's creating yeah. that domino effect here. And it's, it's a mind game because you start yeah. questioning yourself, like what, you know, and I feel like that is like the pin, like that is the true uh, essence of leadership yes. right there. Yeah. Uh, but where do you go? Yeah. And that you don't want to be wrong. Of course, that's the thing. You never want to be wrong. But at the end of the day, and I, the way that I have to, I have to look at the situation and I'm a, like I said, I'm pretty direct. I make decisions most of the time, not emotional. I can't say never, but I really try to be logical. Um, even though I may be feeling emotion, I'm not trying to make those decisions out of that place. I make it out of a different place, but is yes, I want to be empathetic toward them. And I am caring because I, I do care about the people that come and work with me. I care about every single one of them. Um, but then I have to look, are they caring about me? Are they caring about the business? Are their actions demonstrating that? And mm -hmm. if they're not, then my empathy with them is very unilateral. Mm -hmm. Because they're not having empathy towards me or the business or the situation. I can't mm -hmm. work with that. Now, if I have somebody who is, you know, empathetic and, and verbalizing things and, and workable, you can deal with that. If they're not, then you, it, it's unilateral. And then you have to make a unilateral decision. And of course, they're not going to like it. Well, and it just like I, you know, of course, the hindsight's always twenty twenty, And which is why I love these conversations. And here then you are diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, going through, we talked, I mean, five minutes of what last year was, but yeah. that was, uh, it was, hell on earth. It was I mean, it's, yeah, having ha uh, that I've, I haven't, I've learned a lot work, uh, working alongside you and coaching you through that, like has been a coaching experience for me as well. Yeah. Um, and well, I had the cancer just so you could learn oh that. No, no, I'm teasing you. No, no. I'm, I'm glad because you, you have to take the bad things in life and turn it into something because otherwise it's all a waste. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm glad that was able, hopefully I can help you help somebody else down the road that you coach who finds themselves maybe in a similar situation. Well, yeah, absolutely. And myself, you know, <laughs> right? Like, because nobody's immune to adversity. And I, yeah. I also think that um, what I was seeing was so much of the people around you and like yeah. true colors come out. So when we talk about like team, that's one piece of it. And also every other, you know, aspect of investment you make and then friends and family and, you know, our coaching team and your vendors and right. Yeah. You, find out really quickly who's in it for the transaction and who's in it for the relationship. Yeah. Because, and exactly. then, and, and I think like there's that who are what, what, because you had to really respond, like you, you, you had to go, your team had to go to war for you. Oh yeah. Like, they you know? did. And, and so, I'm so thankful they did. They worked their tails off. I mean, it wasn't all roses and sunshine, you know, we had, you know, for the year when we looked at, and I'm still the number one producer in the business and, you know, we're working on getting away from that, but it just, it's the reality of where we're at. And so from that standpoint, I was down my personal numbers for 2023 versus 2022, which, you know, technically we would have been up in 2023, but I was down $373,000, just me, mm -hmm. just me alone. The, with what I missed, we had that much income out of the business. But my team really rallied. And at the end of the year, we were up 7% from 2022 with me being down almost $400,000. Yeah. I mean, right. So, I mean, I just have to say that's a God thing. It's, it's a team thing. I do really believe that God was watching out for me and he will that for anybody else. It's not just me, but he will do that for anyone else. And the hard work and the foundation that I laid yeah in the business yeah. and all those years of humble beginnings where we have a stable patient base. I didn't get my expenses too high. My overhead wasn't too high. We didn't have a ton of debt that we had to pay off. We had money in the bank because I saved money in the bank, which we didn't even have to touch any of the savings. Uh, you know, 
We had it though. If we needed to, we could make payroll without me working. So, you know, it's just, I had all of those lifelines along the way. And so it wasn't any one thing that made that possible, but it was all the things working together that I'd put in the work for, for years and years previous. You know, yeah, I think like when it, when you have those, like, you know, those, those little voices in your head, you know, like I probably, you I feel like I should be paying more attention to this, or I should make that investment, or I should d- spend some more time. I, sometimes we don't know why those, like that energy is shifting us in that direction. And so yeah. I would just, you know, I think like, it, think of that, like really pay attention to that. Cause I look at, I mean, that's, you named a few of the things that the foundation you laid, but even this, the lessons that we know now, like, you know, and even yeah. investing in your leadership development, like those things, like the timing has really been um, as it, as it should have been, yeah, you know, exactly. so let's go back to, so let's, now we're here and yeah. yeah, time has led us. And now we're finally getting your proprietary methodology launch and you're kind of getting the things in place, you know, for this next stage of, of your thought leadership, um, I don't know, uh, coming out, so, so to speak. Yes. Uh, so let's so talk about, I think just would be great to hear about your proprietary methodology. How did you kind of come up with it? I think we, we obviously teach this in our programming and almost all of our programs have a piece of this because it's such an important part of distinguishing yourself in a saturated industry where everybody's injecting the same stuff, you know. And it's only going to get more saturated as time goes exactly. on. Exactly. So it just is what it is. So let's talk about this. How did you come up with it? What is it? And what are you doing with it? Well, ultimately, you know, coaching with you guys helped me. I wouldn't probably have done it on my own, to be honest with you. I needed a kick in the pants, you know, like you need to do this. It's like, okay, fine, I'll do it. Um, And so uh, it's kind of intimidating to think about it. So I I was, you know, I thought I don't want to just come up with something kind of wild and like, look at me and I'm so good and this is what we do. And, And so... Um, but this is something that kind of came from just my, as I started talking to my patients, I just hear myself repeat the same things over and over again, mm-hmm. and kind of my philosophy of why I do what I do and how I treat them. And, and is my philosophy vastly different than anybody else's? Probably not. Um, but it's just, again, all of the little things along the way that have gotten me to where I am and I'm piecing it together. And so I think that's what sets somebody apart that's doing a proprietary methodology is you put it together in this nice little package and you give it a name and it it solidifies it. And like you say, it lends you credibility and it it helps communicate your message much more clearly and succinctly to your patient population, where I just was communicating the message kind of on a one-on-one basis when I was doing consults. Now we can communicate the message to everybody. You know, we can do it on social media and we can do uh, email marketing to our our current yeah. patients and all of these things. Um, so anyway, and I haven't even presented this to my staff yet. So we're going to do this actually a week from today. We're presenting it to the team and we're going to do it kind of in a layered fashion. Um, but we have developed kind of a logo within our logo for the, I have it right here, glow tectonics. And anyway, the philosophy basically is, I, I was just thinking about how we age. I love I love geeking out on all of that anatomy and things. And aging is methodical. It happens a lot earlier than a lot of us think that it does. And there's kind of an order that it happens in unless there's something genetic or weird health conditions or a trauma or something. So there's an it's an orderly process. And so there's a, an order that we have to respect in the way that we fix it or correct it or slow it or prevent it, however that is. Um, And so tectonic plates basically are are the Earth's crust and they're constantly moving. And they move like about like a fingernail grows, right? So they're very slow. It's not something that we see happening. But then when we look at the topography of our landscape, we see mountains and valleys and hills and rivers and crevasses, you know, all of those things. And so that's what happens to our faces. We get mountains and valleys and hills and crevasses that we don't want. Um, And so there's something that is causing those. They're not just happening because, again, it's orderly. And so we age from up to down and out to in and all of that. Um, And so from that standpoint, 
the methodology lays out the order that we we would correct those things in. And we it's also based off of Dr. Uh, Braz's work from Brazil, where he talks about facial shapes determining areas of strength and areas of opportunity or weakness in how we age. And so we know based on someone's, the shape of their face, I can tell a 20 year old what she's gonna need when she's 40. Wow. And so, because I can tell where she's going to show aging first. So you can start building a relationship with your patients that, hey, I know how to handle your face now. I know how to handle your face next year. I can handle it in five years. I can handle it in 20 years. Um, and so from that standpoint, we just identify their facial structure. We come up with our, our methodology, the order that we're going to treat them in. And then we develop a written treatment plan. And so what we're going to do is we send them home with their, their envelope. There's going to be all sorts of, you know, I have information and things in here currently that they'll go home with. And then with their written plan, and we're going to give them payment options where they pay for either six months or 12 months of care based on their customized plan. I know you're like, yay. And so they get discounts and perks, you know, for doing that. Um, and then the thing that I liked or that we're doing, which it, we have not fully implemented this yet. So this is all very theoretical at this point. But we're creating the plans as, and this, we don't even have anything pretty done yet because it's literally my chicken scratches, but good, better, best. And so we're creating a good, better, best plan for them that's customized. The good is six months and the better and best are 12 months. Mm -hmm. And just from financial reasons, I think some people may do want the six month option. And so from that standpoint, we're wanting to give them that. My thing is like where you create a bundle of services where it's like everybody gets this and this and this. Is that customized? No. Yeah. Right. No. It's like, okay, well, we have this plan and everybody gets an IPL and everybody now, now does everybody need an IPL for the most part, unless your skin's too dark, but yes. So those aren't wrong, but I'm like, if we're promoting that we are doing a customized one year plan for you, right. but then they're all the same. I feel like I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. So that's where in our plan, the, they all get Botox or, or Dysport. And so then we have like on the plan, they, it, they get that and filler or a laser. Mm -hmm. And so there's this and or and or thing and we plug in the things and then we can decide what kind of laser do they need? Is there Fitzpatrick too dark for an IPL? Then we need to do a Moxie or, you know, some might be a microneedling, maybe exosomes. So it can truly be customizable, but they have to get the and ors on the checklist to qualify for the plan, but then they're very customizable and then they'll get a certain percentage off on the good, better, best. Plus some so, free exactly. so those of you that are like, this is amazing. Well, I'm sure Jenny will have a training opportunity for you as well to learn and be certified on this. Stuff. <laughs> that's what we want. To, and that's what I want to do because yeah. my vision, my vision with this is um, not only is it going to be better, more complete care for our patients. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will keep them from, roving around elsewhere because people aren't doing this, the things the way we are doing them. And we are truly customizing it for them. Plus, as you say, and your and your things, they talk about people are not going to leave you based on price. They're going to leave you based on results. Right. And we found when we did our most valuable patients uh, that again, KLC helped us identify those. We found that those were people that were buying retail products, getting injectables, getting laser and getting skincare. Those were our MVPs. So this whole thing is to create more MVPs because yeah. those people are what's driving our business. They're happier with the results. They're more vested in their outcomes. Their before and afters are better, all of those things. And so the other thing that we're going to do as we launch this is we're going to really be looking at our metrics, our conversion rate versus our consultation rate. We're going to start like really looking at numbers because my game plan, I'd like to, you know, if we, we do this successfully, if it works, right, if it's good, then um, we can actually train people in this methodology. I'm going to trademark it, you know, so we'll own it. And then people can then use it with our permission after they've been trained. But and I've been to other classes where you're trained in people's methodologies and all. And that's great. But I feel like what they don't teach you is the business side of it. 
mm-hmm. how to train the rest of your ta- your staff, your team, how do you implement it from the practice manager, how do you track it, all of the back end. Like I can learn all of this fancy words and I can educate people about aging and I can come up with a treatment plan, but if we can't implement it and have a nurture campaign on the back end or an education campaign or get my support staff to follow through on it, then I'm SOL. Like what, what good does it do me just in the treatment room? Well, that's the thing. And again, it goes back to, cause I know people are like, I can't believe she's sharing all that. I'm just like predicting what people's thoughts are. She's sharing <laughs> all this on this podcast. And you know, here's the deal, you guys, like it goes back to um, what we talked about, about competent, becoming competitionless requires you living in an abundance mindset. And, and what you're doing, Jenny is, in this whole era of private equity and everybody else is worried about, oh, he stole this and she, what, da, 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 da. And here you are just building your business, increasing your business valuation, increasing the um, strength of your team and your business and your relationships and personalization with um, your ability to customize with each client while strengthening the model of your business. So it's not some froofy, froofy thing like put together a proprietary method. This is a ninja tactic to, as you will, you know, as you're, you, Jenny, are implementing this through, you, you know, like this is a multifaceted thing that this has been years in the making, but like, Mm -hmm. this is not just, I'm going to call myself something again, you know, this is the, the conception to implementation, to integration, to um, pulling everything and everybody through this. And this is what will synthesize um, ultimately what the business will be known for as it expands. So it's just freaking awesome, you know? Yeah. And of course, you know, Jenny, if you know Jenny, it's she's got <laughs> swag already, like all the, you know, the logo and all the stuff. It's just, it's so yeah. fun to watch. We have t-shirts made for the staff. So okay. when we present it, we'll give them a t-shirt yeah. that has the logo on it. Yeah. We have a flyer made, all the things. Yeah. Um, and awesome. so that's the whole thing is if I, if we do wind up somehow making this where we can train people in it, we can have a track for practice managers. So then the practice managers can be trained in the logistics and the back end of it, because then you have the tools to do it in the treatment room, as well as the tools to uh, implement it and make it be successful on the administrative side of the business as well. Love it. Kudos. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so. So all of this, like I look at um, the story of thinking back to Jenny on the Titanic and then I yeah, was one like, of the rats scurrying around on the ship trying to save my all life. So all this, but like, you know, the cockroach analogy of like, you know, and all these, these adversities, these identity shifts, which I think is so cool. I love how this is sort of this podcast and, and conversation with you has really shaped out in the sense of. Um, working through like opportunities at different stages of of business. Um, You know, now as you think about where you are today and you can, you can look clearly look back at those milestones and see how the adversities that, that, that have produced the growth and this tenacious, you know, fire, inside of you to continue, which you've always had, but you've got to like, you know, leverage that to be at this great place where you can be on a podcast talking about this multi-million dollar business you've built. From the lens of today, how do you feel that your story has now shaped your future? Wow. Um, you know, that's really an interesting question. I, I've never been one like that's really big about like five-year goals and all of that. I just haven't, I, it's one of those things where I feel like there's so much I can't control. And sometimes I think, are my goals actually going to limit me from what we could actually do? Like, am I going to put the glass ceiling on myself? Wow. And, so, and so I just am like, I don't like to do that. Um, and plus then you have years like I had last year, which is a complete like, like everything blew up. Um, but I do feel like, uh, you know, of course I'm, more not that I look forward to it, but you know, I know that if and if and when or when challenges come, I'm more adept at handling them or navigating them with wisdom, hopefully with a little bit of grace, um, you know, to be able to survive them and and learn from them and and kind of take the good from the bad or make make lemonade from lemons, you know, the whole thing. Um 
And I feel like if I hadn't been through all of the things and the adversities that I'd gone through, I don't think I would be where I am. And I don't feel like I would be uh, successful, however you define success. You know, there's lots of different ways to define that. And I feel like my definition of that has changed some through the years as well. Um, and I think you've you've also been helpful at kind of getting my brain thinking along those lines as well. So thank you for that, for sure. Um, but from that standpoint, it just you have the strength to be able to step into the unknown because I mean, we have a lot of unknowns. The economy is unknown. The, there's more competition coming. Uh, you know, I do feel like this industry is going to be getting better and better. We're going to have more products and better products and more uh, options to treat patients and give them the best outcomes possible. So that is exciting to be a part of that kind of an industry that's not stagnant, that's constantly growing. And I feel like sometimes you almost have to be really judicious about what you do add on and don't adopt everything that's brand new right out of the gate uh, and just be able to take some time to really evaluate if it fits into your practice ecosystem, if it's something you want to add just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean I should be doing it. And uh, anyway, so all of those things I think are, are going to lead to where we're headed in the future. And ultimately, it's all about steps, just one decision at a time one day at a time and trying to not get too far ahead of yourself. Cause then I think that lends to frustration. Yeah. Do you feel like you would have some sort of different perspective if you could go back, you know, like if you were to have a conversation with your younger self, like the Jenny just starting her entrepreneurial journey, what would you tell her? Oh, I, you know, of course I would let her know that she can do it. Right. Because I think that's the thing that, that I really just was so slow to do everything because I just didn't even see myself as being able to do that. And you know, like, why? Like, why not? So from that standpoint, I would just, you know, give her a kick in the pants and be like, come on now. <laughs> like, you can do this. But then I feel like it's always like, you know, time travel. Remember the movie um, Back to the Future? And of course, where Marty was going back and Doc was like, no, 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 don't tell me, don't tell me, you're going to mess up the whatever, you know, and it's like the trickle down, like you change one thing, it changes everything. Yeah. And so I feel like that for me, even though I feel like things have been slow, but I was intentionally slow, honestly. So I have only myself to really be responsible for that, but I don't think I would change anything. Because all of it has led me to where I am. And I'm, I'm happy where we're at. I'm content, right? To, as, as content as I can be, right? Because that's the problem with us type A entrepreneurs. It's like, what now? What next? Yeah. You know? And so you have to temper that. But I, I am overall content, as content as I can be as a person. And um, I have to kind of give some definitions there. But because um, I think if I would have known, I would have messed it up or tried to push it or force it to happen, you know, or gotten in my head about it or tried to control something that I really couldn't control instead of just letting things kind of unfold organically as they have. So I don't mm -hmm. think I would change anything, but I would probably have, you know, get a little bit more confidence earlier on and maybe started some of the coaching stuff earlier. I think that maybe would have been the difference. It's like, okay, I got this. I, mm -hmm. you know, I can do this. I'm going to do it. And then really start pouring into myself earlier than I had. But other than that, I, I wouldn't want to change a bunch of it because I just mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I think like, I, I think the same thing to myself that I feel like that's such a hard question to answer, you know, and it depends on the day. Exactly, um, but but for sure, like I agree, taking those risks, like I'm all I'm I'm most proud of myself for pushing the times I pushed myself out of my comfort zone and did things yeah. that scared me when those were the biggest, those were the hardest to get myself to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, awesome. Well, I would I think a great way to wrap up would be um Jenny just fr coming from such a, a place of wisdom, right? Um what advice would you have to share with younger injectors who are coming into our industry today? Yeah, that's a that is oh my goodness because the you know the entry into this industry is pretty easy to be honest with you. 
Um, and that's good and bad, you know, and I have to take the good with the bad because it's how I got into the industry. So I, I can't be too like, you know, about it. Um, but I do feel like just operating with integrity. I, I think that is the, in this, and I don't understand it. I don't understand why in the medical aesthetics industry, there's so many things going on that are, I hear these things that happen in other med spots. I'm like, what is happening? I'm like, what is going on? And those people make me have to work twice as hard, but I don't care. I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to work twice as hard. I'm happy to, to have to do that, to, to demonstrate that we do things differently, that we do care, uh, that we're not just trying to sell crap to people, that we really do have, we can really help them. We can really bless them. And we're not high pressure sales and, and doing gimmicks and things along that line. And, and for, so from that standpoint, I just tell them, number one, just be integ have integrity, you know, do things for the right reason, even if it hurts you, you know, and that's been something that I've really tried to stick with. If I promise something to a patient and, it, and it's, you know, I told them, oh yeah, we can absolutely do it this way. And then we can't. And, and I really like, gave them a hard number or something, I stick with it, even if I take a loss. Because I feel like at the end of the day, all I have is my word. And I really want to keep my word as, as best I can. Then the other thing I would tell them is just to know their limits. And it's okay to have them. Like you don't have to be doing everything all at once when you first start. Like mm -hmm. really master a couple things. And when we train people at Glow, when I and when I hire on a new nurse practitioner to train them, I am slow. Like they don't they don't lay their hands on a patient for a month or two. A month or two. I'm paying them. And I mean, I take a loss on that. I take a hit, but I'm willing to do it because in the end, I want the finished product to be excellence and and I want people to be confident in the person that's injecting them. And so I teach them Botox and we teach Botox very slow. Like it's all anatomy first, depth. Then we start dosing. Then we talk placement. Then we talk consult. Then they can actually inject somebody. I mean, it's a long process. And so I talk, get good at Botox and maybe lips and cheeks. You know, just start with the baby steps. Master those things. Get some wins. Then add more complicated things as you go. Don't try to do everything all at once. Yeah. That's something that's come up in my mind through as a theme through a lot of what we've talked about today is just to play the long game. Yeah. You no, know, because um it ultimately that's all it is. You know, and it's how you're going to have the ups and downs and then navigating through those. Um, I think when you come from the perspective that down, I I still I'm still gonna have to. I'm going to have to deal with the decisions I make today and 10 years down the road. So like, why, why, why think about just how it's going to impact me now? Think about the bigger picture and what I'm building and what I want to be known for, you know, yeah. which I think is it's hard to do when you're in this sprint and this race and you feel the competition and all of those things. But Absolutely. ultimately, I think, um, I think that's just such incredible advice, you know, and just doing the right things for the right reasons with integrity. Um, and um, and for the bigger picture, you know, yeah. so, and I just tell them it's okay to be a novice. And that's because a lot of times you come from being an expert in one field and you come to a new field and then you're a novice again, it's very uncomfortable, especially for adults. Yes. And I tell them just to lean into that and it's okay. Like don't run from it or hide it, but embrace it because that's the only way that you move from being a novice back to being an expert, because otherwise, if you hide things and you don't really fully learn things, then from that standpoint, you'll always kind of be a novice, right? You're going to be trapped kind of in this circuitous situation. And so just to embrace the, the discomfort and to lean into it and, and not be embarrassed about it. And from that standpoint, it will be very freeing because otherwise it can be really intimidating and uncomfortable um, but that's where if you just acknowledge it, lean into it, accept it, and just know that it's temporary, then you can get more out of that season than if you ignore those things. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well, Jenny, this has been such an amazing interview. Um, I want to thank you for sharing, being so open and sharing so much of your experiences. Um, like I said, you know, we've talked about before, I think there's an enough conversation about 
the hard times yeah. uh, and the, the times when things aren't like looking, you aren't the flashiest looking thing on yeah. social media, but you're just, you know, putting one foot in front of the other and yeah. everybody's going to go through that. And so I think, you know, when you talk about timing, I have a feeling uh, this podcast is going to touch a lot of people, um, yeah. you know, in, in, in the midst of time when there's uncertainty um, and your advice to just confidently step into the unknown, um, I resonates very deeply for me too. So I appreciate that. Well, so thanks for, yeah. thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's such an honor. I absolutely love your podcast. It's one of my absolute favorites. And so from that standpoint, it's really an honor to be, to be a voice on it as well. So thank you for the opportunity. My pleasure. I know. I remember you messaging me back, like way, way <laughs> back about the podcast, like, you know, questions. So you, you actually stimulated a lot of thought for me and provoking many of the topics we talk about. So, um, okay, Jenny, well, we will be um, obviously, you know, I'll be seeing you on the flip side and we'll be in touch with our audience and I'll be sure to link up um, your social. Um, if anybody Thank wants to kind of touch, obviously follow Jenny. Uh, she also gives business tips on her social media and there'll be more to come out about her glow tectonic um, proprietary methodology and how you can get involved in that. So thanks so much, Jenny. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hang tight leader. As a high growth female badass, there's only one thing standing in the way of you showing up as the most confident and dynamic leader you desire to be this year. And that is closing the gap between where you are now and where you want to be. This year, stop dreaming about the future and start making your thought leadership goals a reality. I want to help you make that one empowered decision that will be a life-changing catalyst for you personally and professionally. And that is to become a more dynamic communicator on stage, in leadership, and online, to monetize your expertise, and to develop a revenue stream that doubles as brand visibility rocket fuel. So listen up. Here's what I know. Your ability to deliver a potent message touches every piece of your business, from team building and training to sharing your perspective, whether on stage or through social media. Each day that you're not working on the skill is a day that you're leaving money and most importantly, your potential for legacy building impact on the table. Introducing our brand spanking new program, Voice of Impact, a completely personalized elite coaching program that expertly guides you to master the art of communication through thought leadership so you can share your experience and knowledge with an authentic and dynamic presence that transcends. In just six weeks, we'll provide the framework, the personalized coaching, and the tools to unlock your powerful presence so you can confidently step onto the center of any stage you want to occupy. Sign up now or schedule a no-pressure discovery call to learn more at klcconsultants.com forward slash VOI. See you there.